<laughs> Dr. George Kinney had been a popular and well-liked principal of Northport High School in Sarasota, Florida for the past 10 years. But in 2011, that all changed when he was blamed for the deaths of three of his high school students. It was no secret that Principal Kinney was highly interested in hypnosis and often performed it on his students and staff. For example, he often hypnotized anxious students and athletes to help them relax and to perform better. School district officials warned Dr. Kenny several times not to hypnotize students unless he did so as a demonstration in a psychology class and only with written consent from the parents of each student. Some parents reported that the hypnosis sessions helped their teenage children and so they continued to give Dr. Kenny permission to perform his hypnosis outside the classroom. Brett Wilson, the father of Northport senior Casey Wilson, said Dr. Kenny's hypnosis helped his son relax when shooting free throws on the basketball court and while taking tests. Dr. Kenny would have around 30 to 40 sessions with Casey, hoping to improve his concentration. The first death occurred in March 2011, when 16-year-old star quarterback Marcus Freeman died in a fatal car accident. After leaving a dentist appointment, Marcus drove off a freeway with his girlfriend, who survived the crash. His parents believe that he was trying to use self-hypnosis techniques that Dr. Kenny taught him. These techniques were to help Marcus deal with the pain of a root canal before he died. Dr. Kenny also taught Freeman to self-hypnotize in an effort to overcome pain during football games. His girlfriend, who was badly injured in the crash, told police that Freeman had a strange look on his face moments before his car veered off the interstate. However, others speculate that he crashed due to driving right after the dental work. Weeks later, on April 8, 2011, 16-year-old Wesley McKinley committed suicide. He hanged himself outside a vacant home near his family's house. Dr. Kenny admitted to hypnotizing Wesley three different times, including the day before Wesley committed suicide. McKinley, a talented guitar player, was applying to the very prestigious Juilliard School of Music and agreed to be hypnotized because he was worried about an upcoming audition and wanted to improve his performance. But on the day of his death, friends testified McKinley was acting strange. One friend said McKinley asked him to punch him in the face as they got off the school bus together. Then, weeks after his death, on May 4, 2011, 17-year-old Brittany Palumbo hanged herself at her home in the 3000 block of Sesame Street. Brittany was an excellent math student but was upset about some disappointing test scores and was hypnotized by Dr. Kenny for test anxiety five months before her death. She was also hoping the hypnosis would improve her SAT scores, but it never did, and she became somewhat despondent. During the initial investigation, Dr. Kinney admitted to hypnotizing Marcus Freeman and later admitted that he also hypnotized Brittany and Wesley, as well as more than 70 other students and staff over the past five years. Principal Dr. Kinney was placed on administrative leave in May 2011 before he resigned in June 2012. He was eventually charged with two misdemeanors, including practicing therapeutic hypnosis without a license. He pleaded no contest, served a year of probation, and gave up his teaching career. Also in 2012, the families of the deceased students each filed a wrongful death civil suit against the school board, alleging that the school officials had failed to do enough to stop Dr. Kinney from hypnotizing students. However, the families could not sue Dr. Kinney himself because school district employees 
are considered an extension of the school board under the law. Therefore, the only entities families could sue was the school district itself. In a settlement approved by Sarasota County School Board, each family received $200,000. Before the settlement headed off to trial, the Sarasota School Board was preparing a defense that claimed there was no link between the hypnosis and the teenagers' deaths. The district's lawyers hired a licensed hypnotherapist and psychotherapist named Dr. Ellen Gamberg as an expert witness to testify. She said the family's claims were unfounded and that on the day of his death, Freeman could not have hypnotized himself using knowledge gained from his sessions with Dr. Kinney. Dr. Gamberg stated that one of the hallmarks of putting yourself into a self-hypnosis is to enter a very relaxed state of attention and focus, which is likely extremely impossible while driving a car. A lawyer for the families of the deceased teens would say they hadn't sued the school district for money, but to ensure that the school district would be more vigilant in the future. Their attorney, Damian Mallard, stated that Dr. Kenny altered teenagers' underdeveloped brains and they all died because of it. While reports stated that there was no clear link between hypnosis and suicide, there is the possibility that hypnotizing someone with underlying mental health issues can cause serious problems. The attorney spoke to other students who said, Dr. Kenny hypnotized them in a hotel room during a school trip to Orlando in 2009. One student stated in a written deposition that he was in a trance after being told he wouldn't be able to find his room because all the room numbers would be changed to Chinese. He was lost for about 20 to 25 minutes walking around while seeing the Chinese letters. It was also said that Dr. Kenny made a couple of guys put lipstick on and everybody thought it was funny. Tampa psychologist Richard Spana stated, The issue in working with hypnosis is that there could be latent things that are triggered like past experiences and memories, and the patients can have a bad reaction. He said that hypnosis in and of itself doesn't cause suicide, but it can trigger some mental health problems that are dormant. In his interview with the investigators, a very emotional Dr. Kinney said he felt terrible about putting his school and his students through something that they didn't need or deserve to have to endure on top of all the tragedy they had already experienced. In Florida, it's against the law to perform therapeutic hypnosis unless it is monitored or conducted by a medical professional but that law itself is very vague and has rarely been used since it was enacted in 1961. Dr. Kinney's lawyer said that Dr. Kinney had no indication that Wesley and Brittany would take their own lives. He said he had used hypnosis to help the two students with test anxiety and during Brittany's session, one of her parents was even present. Dr. Kinney now runs a bed and breakfast in North Carolina and has sold therapeutic hypnosis MP3s and CDs on Amazon for a time after the student's deaths. He learned hypnosis online at omnihypnosis.com and recorded podcasts where he talked about reducing test anxiety and improving sports performances through hypnosis. He told investigators that his passion for helping students overcame his good judgment and he insisted that everything he did was in the best interest of the children he hypnotized. Some people have said the deaths are simply a coincidence and it sounds more like a witch hunt by people who don't understand how hypnosis works and they're just looking for someone to pin their grief on while others side with the families of the teens. Curiosity got the best of me and I began researching other similar cases and found several with one dating as far back as 1889. I warn you, the upcoming pronunciations of some names are not going to be great. In Paris on July 26, 1889, Augustine Gouff, a successful businessman known for his sexual adventures, bumped into an acquaintance of his by the name of Mikhail Erod. 
Erod said he had broken up with his girlfriend Gabrielle Bompard and that she wanted to see Augustine. Eagerly, Augustine made his way to the young girl's apartment. As Augustine was seducing Bompard, Erod slipped a noose around his neck and strangled him. After looting the body, co-conspirators Erod and Bompard put the body in a trunk and dumped it 300 miles away from Paris. Unfortunately for Erod, witnesses had seen him talking to Augustine before his disappearance. As a result, Erod became a wanted man, but he would flee before the authorities could catch him. On January 22, 1890, Bompard turned herself in, claiming that she was innocent of murder because Erod had hypnotized her into doing his will. In May 1890, Erod was arrested in Cuba and extradited back to Paris. That summer, Bompard and Erod went to trial. It was one of the first times that the power of suggestion through hypnosis was used as a defense. In the end, Bompard received 20 years in prison and Erod was publicly executed by guillotine on February 4, 1891. On September 17, 1894, a man identified only as Mr. Nakam was visiting 23-year-old clairvoyant Ella Salomon in her uncle's home in Hungary. Nakam wanted medical advice because his brother was spitting up blood, but the doctors weren't sure if the blood was coming from his stomach or lungs. So Ella agreed to be hypnotized by Nakam in front of her parents and uncle. Once hypnotized, she started to describe the lungs in great detail. When Nakam asked if his brother would die, Ella said, be prepared for the worst, then collapsed and mysteriously died minutes later. At the time, it was believed that her death was caused by a bungled hypnosis performed by a layman and her brain couldn't take the excitement. According to the Journal of American Medical Association, Ella Salomon was the first person to die while under hypnosis. Also in 1894, a wealthy farmer named Anderson Gray, who lived near Sumner County, Kansas, was embroiled in a lawsuit. One of the witnesses in the case was his neighbor, Thomas Patton. Wanting to silence Patton permanently, Gray went to the living quarters of his farmhand, Thomas McDonald. Gray told McDonald that Patton was spreading rumors about McDonald's wife, which provoked an argument between McDonald and Patton. After the fight, McDonald returned home. Gray visited McDonald again and apparently hypnotized him. Under hypnosis, Gray convinced McDonald that he had to kill Patton or Patton would kill him first. McDonald tried to protest, but Gray's hypnotic influence was too strong. Gray also hypnotized McDonald into having perfect aim with a rifle when he had been a terrible shot before the hypnosis. Gray then told McDonald where Patton would be riding in the woods. In a Gray-induced trance, McDonald waited until Patton rode by and shot him in the heart. Both Gray and McDonald were arrested. Gray was tried first, found guilty, and sentenced to death by hanging. McDonald, who fully admitted to pulling the trigger, was found not guilty because he was under Gray's trance. In 1938, a pregnant 23-year-old woman named Marie Columbos was worried about having her baby in the traditional manner. Interested in giving birth under hypnosis, she contacted Robert Gilbert, a.k.a. The Great Gilbert, a 20-year veteran of vaudeville who specialized in hypnosis. According to a local newspaper, Gilbert had recently helped a woman give birth painlessly through hypnosis. Agreeing to meet with Columbus, Gilbert went to her house in Glendale, California on January 30th for a practice session. At some point, the police were called 
and when they arrived at the house, they found Columbo's dead on the couch. Her arms were folded over her chest, and she had a faint smile. Gilbert claimed that he hadn't done anything to Columbo's, and that she had collapsed on the floor, and then he placed her on the couch afterward. Gilbert was quickly arrested, and an autopsy was performed on Columbo's, but no cause of death could be found. She was buried, exhumed, and autopsied again. Still, there was no conclusion about what had killed the expected mother. Gilbert went to trial and claimed that his hypnosis was not dangerous, yet he was found guilty and given two to five years in prison. Eventually, his conviction would be overturned due to lack of evidence. On October 26, 1948, 26-year-old Jerome Ferrari brought a young woman back to his spacious home he shared with his wife Betty in Los Angeles, California. Betty was not happy and chased both of them out of the house. A short time later, Jerome returned and attacked Betty. Charles Fauci, a man who rented a room in the house, got a gun and handed it to the mansion's handyman, Alan Adron. Charles told Alan that Jerome was killing Betty. Hearing Betty's screams, Alan found the couple fighting in the kitchen and shot Jerome twice before the weapon jammed. He then beat Jerome with the gun until Betty snatched it from Alan and tried to fire it. But the gun was still jammed, so she picked up a meat cleaver and whacked her husband on the head 23 times. Betty, Charles, and Alan were all arrested. Alan confessed to the crime and initially pled guilty to second-degree murder and even testified as a witness for the prosecution at Betty and Charles's trial. However, the two were acquitted because they testified that Jerome was violent and that Betty was scared for her life. When Alan went before the judge for sentencing, the court was asked to consider a second plea of not guilty because of insanity. Defense psychiatrists argued that Allen wasn't responsible for the murder because he had been hypnotized into shooting Jerome. According to the psychiatrist, Allen was placed in a trance by the power of suggestion when the gun was put in his hands and he heard Betty's screams. Supposedly, this caused Allen to shoot Jerome. As a result, he was found not guilty by reasons of insanity at the time of the murder. However, he didn't have to go to a psychiatric hospital because he was considered sane after the shooting. In Copenhagen, on March 29, 1951, 33-year-old Pal Wichman Hardrup walked into a bank, pulled out a gun, and demanded money. When it wasn't turned over, he shot the bank manager Hans Wisbaum and teller Kaj Moller, instantly killing both of them. When Hardrup was arrested, he claimed that the murders and attempted robbery weren't his fault because he had been hypnotized earlier in prison by his 39-year-old cellmate Bjorn Nilsson. Three times a week, over a three-month period, Nilsson had supposedly hypnotized Hardrup and continuously went through the steps of the robbery. According to Hardrup, Nilsson had instructed him to ask for the money, and if the teller didn't comply, he was to shoot the teller and ask the next one. Hardrup even admitted to an earlier robbery where he had turned over all the stolen money to Nilsson. Nilsson was arrested for planning the robberies and pushing Hardrup to shoot the two bank employees. After both men were tried, Hardrup was committed to a mental institute and Nielsen was given life imprisonment. Eventually, both were released after only serving 18 years. In the fall of 1952, 21-year-old Gerard Rosenblum was studying for his master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania. On October 2nd, his mother walked down to the basement and found that her son had hanged himself and his death was immediately ruled a suicide. A month later, Gerard's death was brought to a coroner's jury. 
a coroner's jury is similar to a grand jury, but instead of trying to indict a person, it's meant to assist the coroner in determining a person's cause of death. For example, in 2018, a coroner's jury was used to rule whether the Hart family crash in California was deliberate or not. Back to the 1952 coroner's jury, a lawyer for the Rosenblum family presented evidence that the young man's death wasn't a suicide, but a failed attempt at suspended animation through self-hypnosis. According to his mother, Gerard had always been fascinated by hypnosis and especially the idea of levitating himself. The lawyer argued that his death was an accidental hanging while trying to levitate under hypnosis. The coroner's jury agreed, ruling that he died as a result of hypnotic research. In September 1993, 24-year-old Sharon Tabarn attended a hypnosis show at a pub in Leland, Lancashire, England. That's where hypnotist Andrew Vincent put her in a trance. In order to wake her from her trance, Vincent told her she would feel a 10,000 volt electric shock in her seat. She awoke with a shock and left the pub. On the way home, Sharon complained that she felt dizzy and would die of asphyxiation hours later in her own bed. Sharon was a healthy woman two weeks shy of her 25th birthday. She had been drinking that night, but not an amount that would generally cause asphyxiation. However, her death was ruled an accident. Sharon's mother blamed the hypnosis show. Her lawyer argued that hypnosis somehow relaxed Sharon's gag reflex, which ultimately led to her choking. Her mother also said that her daughter was terrified of getting electrocuted, which could have contributed to her death. She called for a ban on public hypnosis shows, which British ministers discussed, but nothing ever came of it. So what do you think? Was Principal Kenny just doing a good deed? Or was he responsible for the deaths of three teenagers? Let me know what you think in the comment section below.